Hello everybody and welcome to Stardo TV. My name is Eli Regalado. Uh, joining us today is Justin Beck. Justin is the CEO and co-founder of an organization called PerBlue. Uh, prior to starting PerBlue, Beck held several software engineer and program manager positions at organizations such as Microsoft and Google. Justin, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Justin, what exactly is PerBlue and what is it that you folks do? So Purple is a, we're a company that's making uh, mobile and social games, more specifically, deep location-based role-playing games. So our flagship product is called Parallel Kingdom. And Parallel Kingdom has been around for quite a bit of time, um, years actually. Um, we actually launched with the initial release of Android um, back with the G1, you know, if we can remember those days of, of antique, you know, technology. Sure. But, um, you know, Parallel Kingdom is a location-based role-playing game. So you kind of take over your city, um, capture your home, wage war against your neighbors, you, you build flags, um, collect resources and make yourself more powerful, and then show people that how powerful you are by dominating. When you, when you talk about having this game basically being able to take over territory in your own backyard, what does that mean? Is it like a Google mapping type feature? Or? Yeah, so the whole game is actually played on a Google map. So, you know, you can build buildings and you kind of see that it's relevant in the sense of, you know, like, if this is a cross street that's really emotionally important to you, you can build that area, build your building on your home or build your home or log cabin at your real log cabin that you have. If you have a log cabin, you know, in real life, but the you know, so it's 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 connected via the kind of Google Map, um, but the the real relevance there is the emotional connection, right? People really want to own and control their own territory. So with that, then, it was was that the initial vision of Parallel Kingdoms? So Parallel Kingdoms, since we start, so we so we started in college, you know, we were an initial team of about five people, and you know, we've now grown to be you know about forty employees, which is which is cool. But the initial vision was actually created at two o'clock in the morning. When we were sick of doing math homework, and the idea was, let's make a really simple role playing game for the phone. Let's throw in GPS. Maybe it'd be good to make some money, um, but let's make sure it's darn fun. And so that was that was the vision that was you know crystallized then. And about four a.m., you know, we were done. No, um, at four a.m. we had the first version, which we tweaked completely and changed um, dramatically. Um, but that was the original vision that we still execute on today. So you're talking about a couple friends sitting around and creating a GPS mapping game on the Android device, and you know, two in the morning. Most people I know in college were, you know, busy drinking beer or getting ready to go snowboarding, you know, so are you guys all, uh, you know, all software engineers or are you guys kind of like a mixed bag or? So me and my co-founder are both uh, computer engineers. Uh, you know, we're, we're pretty geeky and nerdy. I mean, I, I would give us a lot of credit there. Um, I mean, I, uh, you know, he's extremely passionate about games and I was more passionate about entrepreneurship and th those mm -hmm. two combined together is, you know, the, uh, the 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 ingredients that made Purblue possible. Um, since then, you know, we've uh, brought in a lot more artists and artistic talent, along with statistics and marketing talent. Um, and th the kind of combination of this, you know, uh, the whole, you know, we all work together as one team. So it's engineers, artists, marketing, statistics. I mean, the whole thing is kind of one operating organism. And so I would say that's how our DNA is very much that. Um, you know, as far as, you know, drinking in college and things like that, you know, we, we also had fun in college, um, you know, so, you know, maybe not necessarily, I mean, we were pretty busy coding, so we, could, we couldn't be drinking a lot, otherwise the Balmer Peak just, you know, tanks. Um, so, but, but we've, we've had a good time. So, you have these two college friends, you know, in college, you guys are going to start this game, and, but your kids, your, your college kids, right? Did people think you were crazy? So... I think when, with all entrepreneurs, you know, I think it's more socially accepted now. But I mean, in general, everyone thinks you're kind of a little bit crazy. Um, back then, the fact of location-based gaming was really new. Not many people had smartphones, and the fact that even you're playing a game on a phone was a really hard concept to pitch to people because you're like, you know, normally people are in the basement with a big monitor with really high-powered graphics cards, and so. The fact that with PK, you know, also with PK, I mean, the avatars aren't, you know, the most, it's not 3D rendering, it's back to old 2D, you know, sprites moving around. And so the fact that we can entertain people and uh, from and monetize, the, you know, our user base by providing just really awesome gameplay 
and the user experience for players has, has really been the validation that's enabled us to, to people think us, we're a little less crazy. Um, they think us more as just like, you know, confusing, you know, why is that working? You know, uh, I think people say that a lot to us um, still today. Well, let's talk, you know, proof of the pudding and actually having users use your game. How many users uh, have used Parallel Kingdom uh, to date? So we just turned over on Friday, actually, um, about 1 million users. Wow. And so 1 million user accounts are created. And, uh, you know, we've been able to entertain and retain a lot of players. So there's a, a large percentage of our user base that's, playing, that's been playing our game for over a year, um, even two years. Um, now that, I don't know if our two-year anniversary, yeah, so uh, between a year and two years. So there's a, a large amount of very loyal players still playing the game today. So th the gaming sector uh, in and of itself is very competitive. Uh, the mobile space is becoming increasingly more and more competitive. So what really sets Parallel Kingdoms apart from this slew of choices that I as a consumer have when I turn on my iPhone, when I open my computer? Yep. So in mobile games, I mean, it's a huge industry, and it's, and it's growing still a lot. I mean, we're at a, a huge growth rate. It's, it's far from over. Um, as far as the competition, you're right, there's a lot of competitors out there. The, the cool thing for us is that a lot of the competitors are fighting with each other in what I call their apples, right? It's mass market, casual kind of games, tower defenses, Farmville clones, you know. There's just all these very shallow games. And the cool, th I mean, the, the, the truth is, is people play a shallow game for a short period of time. I mean, even if you're talking the best game, we'll, we'll barely retain a person's attention for over three months. Um, so Parallel Kingdom is a whole different thing. I call it an orange compared to an apple. Um, Parallel Kingdom is immersive. It's a very multiplayer. It's a deep game. There's tons of stuff to do. I mean, when people get into PK, they really don't want to leave, you know, because there's so much things for them to do, and they already got all this wealth and, and things built up that they can just kind of pivot around and do different fantasies. So what we offer is, is, a, is a place for people to go, uh, that to experience a real true deep gameplay to b develop real relationships with players and and have those you know social quirky you know kind of gangster to gangster um, experiences but that's been really valuable and so our players really appreciate that once they figure out that that's what they get with Peril Kingdom I, in the beginning it is hard I mean a lot of these casual games are just so easy to get into that you know Peril Kingdom is a little intimidating to a lot of people but um, what we've been able to see is that we can build a really long term business and a really long term product by providing a, a deeper experience on the phone. So that's kind of what we do. Yeah. So and it's a free-to-play game, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So you take a free-to-play game uh, that has 40 employees. Where's the money come from? <laughs> so as many businesses, you know, and many people realize, like, how do you make money from free downloads? And the answer is we make a lot of money from free downloads. And so um, the key thing is you provide a phenomenal product that people are really into. And so for the real interesting truth is in PK situation, we make most of our money of a player after one month. Hmm. So one month, the player is still not actually paying that much money. Now, that's not all true for all free-to-play games. A lot of free-to-play games make money the first day, second day, third day. But it's from a very small percentage of payers. We, have a, we convert a larger percentage of payers eventually. Um, and then as they continue to play the game for the following months after, you know, one month or whatever, they will continue to buy virtual goods. So to really answer your question, they buy a, like a pseudo currency. It's like a, a good and they can use those goods to d do all sorts of different things. So when they can level up their character, they can buy clothes for their avatar. They can um, go to the trade post, which they can then buy a whole bunch of commodities. So like, for example, instead of chopping down a whole bunch of trees and mining a whole bunch of stone, you can just go buy those commodities and then build up your awesome kingdom and castle by using the commodities that you purchased with a currency, or with this uh, virtual good currency. So that ends up allowing us to monetize uh, players because it gives them something of meaning to uh, attribute and spend money on. That's not just like a speed up or not just making the grass grow a little faster, right. but actually some like, hey, I actually got you know a thousand stone, and I'm just going to build the awesomest castle, and then I'm going to wage war with all these other resources. I'm going to completely destroy you, and that's kind of fun. <laughs> awesome. So you're creating this entire virtual world mapped out on our physical world, so people have a more intimate experience with this game. Where do you come up with these ideas? I mean, this isn't something that most people would even begin to dream of, and here you guys have not only dreamed of it, you've got a million other people on board with it and you're making money so I would say you know so our team is very very neat I mean they we spend a lot of time brainstorming and optimizing out ideas 
through a creative process. And so it's a very creative institution. We, you know, what I call is a flat idea hierarchy where basically anyone can come up with an idea and if it gets validated and we can kind of like look at it, we'll do it. Um, and so this is very similar to Facebook um, strategy in the sense of, you know, they have the hacker way that was, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's letter, where it's just the employees can just create ideas and, 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 uh, and just do it and implement it. So we have that. But the other thing I really want to give us a lot of credit, or not give us a lot of credit, but give those million players a lot of credit, because our players are extremely active and extremely vocal in expressing their opinions about the gameplay and where they'd like it to go. And to be really honest, that's been very helpful, because it's not just us sitting in a dark room. Trying to actually, it's a bright room, but it's not us just figuring out by ourselves what's to make. But our players give us constant feedback of what they love and what they don't necessarily like, and that allows us to really, um, what I call like tempering steel, kind of tempering awesome gameplay. And without that, you know, I don't think we'd have nearly what the product that we have now. Right. So here at Stardom, I mean, we deal with companies and have talked and spoken with companies, everyone from you know small. Uh, two-man shops, 40-person gaming companies like yourself, all the way up to you know the, the biggest, baddest companies on the planet. And ideas are one thing, but how have you folks really capitalized on taking an idea from one of your employees or your uh, users and actually putting that through to production for a value add? Yeah, so um, execution is everything. You know, I, I tell people the same right. thing. An idea is worth about a dime. And this idea, the same. Uh, Peril Kingdom's idea at 2 o'clock in the morning is probably worth less than a dime. Um, <laughs> the, the real truth is you've got you know, to be, uh, be at it. You've got to go start working and pounding some pavement and putting things together. Uh, it took us three major versions of Peril Kingdom to make money. Hmm. That's one thing. It took us two versions to retain customers. And before that, we, sh we threw away three prototypes because the testing was just bad, right? So it takes... Um, it takes kind of some guts to just go build something and see if it's going to work. And then it's also got to take guts to throw it away and say, that's crap. <laughs> you know, and say, you know, that is not what we're going to ship. Um, you know, and I think that mixed with, you know, validating traction, I think is really important. You know, I think shipping something out there and getting some traction so you validate that you actually can retain people's attention, um, I think is probably this, the biggest success there. Um, so, I'm, I mean, on my end, on the, on the corporate leadership end, you know, I, I've said, um, I've made a mistake or I've failed or like this was a, you know, a disaster many times and I've wasted lots of money and lots of time by making mistakes, but I always try to learn from them and, you know, by doing good postmortems and having a culture where you kind of just own up to your problems and your errors, um, I think has helped that scale as we've grown. Well, you know, in talking about the people and the, on, on both sides, your users and the people internally and kind of leading them as, as a leader and a CEO, you know, how has creating this video game uh, really helped you understand people? Yeah, so I've, I've learned a chunk um, from employees and also players. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, to, uh, to entrepreneurs out there, you know, really don't ever underestimate the power of psychology and really knowing how psychology works, right? We all experience things in different ways, and by the ordering of the experiences, we're, the emotional effects are, are, you know, almost consistent. You know, I mean, you can, you can model that out. But anyways... So what have I learned about people? I think the first one is, is trust is way underrated in our culture. Like you should, building and building trust is one of the most important things in, in, the oper in what you do on a daily basis. You know, my business partner and I trust each other extremely, uh, you know, in, in one cohesive group. Um, the employees the same way. Like we have a lot of trust in this. And the players, you know, players, they don't necessarily, they trust some of their players, other players, but they hate other ones <laughs> and they don't trust them. So. I think it's really exaggerated. Not, it's it's really made it clear to me how important trust is in a lot of things. The other one is I'd say hard work is more valuable than raw intel intelligence. You know, I would you know there were there were certain team members that when we're, when things the chips were down, you know they they would leave or they'd do something and you know I'd be like they would come back afterwards and be like can I have a job and I'm like no, <laughs> you know and that's the, the trust mixed with like you gotta just be willing to slog through it sometimes. So. My, those are my two biggest things out of, the, oh, I'll take my third one. The third one's happy. People mm -hmm. love rewards. Um, you know, rewarding people is in general really good. And the other thing is that people in games in particular, they want to earn their rewards. They don't want to be given it. And they actually don't even really want to buy it. They want to feel like they're accomplishing something and they, it was their achievement that got them this result. They don't really care about you just randomly giving them something randomly. You know, they want to have it be connected to the work they've done. Um, and yes, games are work. It's not necessarily, I mean, people play them like 40 hours a day. 
and they don't really want to go to work. But at the end of the day, games are just like another job um, where you spend lots of time working at it. Um, but it's fun, so people don't really care. Right. So what has you know, creating Parallel Kingdoms taught you about you yourself personally? Oh, uh, so as far as myself, um, so I have, a, I have a very broad set of passions. I, I really enjoy the challenge. So, okay. cha- you know, I, I, don't, I don't run Prabhu for the money. I, I run Prabhu for the challenge and the fun. And if you're an entrepreneur and a CEO, you, do, you don't get more challenge and fun than that. I mean, right. it, it's, it's very, it's very um, satisfying to give people jobs, to pay people, to give people entertainment, to create products that they love. I mean, that is a very rewarding thing. So I would say I learned that. That was one of the other key learn, learnings. Um, I think also um, having, for me, you know, I think one of the reasons I've grown as a good leader of the company is I've been really able to take on new skills and able to learn on new things. And no, no, like if I need to also do financial modeling, well, I'll go do some financial modeling. If I need to learn some more game design, I'll go learn some more game design. And so as I've been able to move my skills around, um, it's made at least the board of directors a lot happier with me as a CEO because they're not worried about me being outpaced by the company because I'm always grabbing onto that new thing and learn, and willing to learn the new skills required, willing to humbly admit that I don't know how certain things work or I don't know how you know these finances go or I don't know how to model this problem, but I'm going to figure it out. Right. I'm some intelligent person and I can and I have some interest. So I've also learned that 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 is something I can do and that's something I enjoy doing. So those are my two postmortems, maybe. Yeah. For what I learned. Well, and, and you know, having this, uh, you know, a sea of things that you constantly need to learn and juggling product development and ideas and employees coming and going and just everything, you know, what has been, out of all that, what has been the most challenging? With everything that you've just mentioned, what's the most challenging thing that you've ever had to face being an entrepreneur? The, I would say the most challenging thing that I have personally challenged through is really a focus problem. So. The one thing I can tell um, many entrepreneurs, and the most important thing you can do is focus in on doing one thing, shipping one product to one customer base in one centralized growth strategy. I unfortunately have my ideas, like too many ideas, right? You just kind of like sp- sprinkling around to doing many things, and that is the, is the surest way to kill, to kill what's going on. Um, so I would say that's my, my, biggest, um, my biggest own personal feat. Um, I would, I'm going to answer the question a second way. You know, sure. this is me not having one just answer. The uh, you know, the second thing is I think with the people and creating cr- creating awesome creative output as like yeah, like you said, there's a million things going on. You have to balance and be able to be really good in prioritization, and to just really only do the most important task and to just cut be cut all the things that aren't important. That's very challenging and I think when I look at the whole day each day was my biggest challenge is prioritization um, so but that's what I'm paid to do so I'll keep doing it. well I think you just really hit the nail on the head not only for every entrepreneur uh, and innovator watching this show but also for us internally I mean we've struggled with the same things we have a magazine we have a radio show we're just getting involved with TV we have a million ideas and what to implement and how to implement how do you know what to do and I know that's kind of a loaded yeah. question, but it's, a, it's an honest question. You know, where do you really know how to focus? And is, does your focus change if you feel like you're focusing on the wrong thing? So, yeah, so here's my, my technique. Um, it, it, it's kind of a little complicated, but the first one is, is so there's three things. So the first question is, like, what do you want, right? What is your true goal that you want to be? Who's your role models? What's the pay? picture of that you're painting so paint that picture first so then take all the tasks and all your opportunities and put them on a list and basically say okay if i'm going to sort to what gets us to that goal what is the most important and then you're doing the sorting process so you're just you know sorting it all out to what's your best opportunity what you feel like you concretely can can really concretely can do that's going to get you closer to your goal and all those things bulb up to the top that's and so it's sorted most important the least important then you eyeball the list and see what can we practically actually accomplish with our ta- staff, team, size, time, money, everything. You kind of eyeball that and then draw a line. Anything south of that line you're going to cross out, not touch, not think about, just throw it away. It's completely worthless for you to think about because it's not important. And then as far as what you do, how, how, you, know, you basically pick the top item and do that item first until it's completely done. Cross out to the next one. And you always work from the top all the way to the bottom and res- I resort daily. Um, so. That's it. And so basically it's this, you know, it's, it's a process, right? But 
the key thing is that crossing out and drawing that line and crossing out the stuff from the bottom. That's what people screw up the most. You know, and college is a great example, right? Teachers and professors give you all these homework assignments, and everyone expects everyone to do everything. And it's just like a complete mess. Like, no one can do that, right? And so the first thing a, a good student can do is just cross out all the homework assignments that aren't worth it. And by doing that, you don't worry about them. You don't even think about, you know, I have to get over there to read. I have to read the assignment. I have to figure out what to do. I have to work with my team. I have to fill it in. All that goes away because you're not worrying about it because it's not important. And at, at the end of the day, the top 20% of what you do will produce 80% of the value. And you, we can just learn that over and over again by doing the wrong by, by doing the wrong percentage of work, or we can just suck it up and just do the top. <laughs> right. So. That's great advice. And you know, for the flip side, flip, side, flip side of the equation, you're going to have many people watching this show who are kind of nervous about taking that jump and you know, who are hearing this and all the challenges that you've gone through. What advice do you have for somebody that wants to be an entrepreneur but is scared to death to do so? Right. So two things. One thing I would ask is like, why are you scared? What is the true reason you're scared? Is it is it because it might fail, or is it because you might succeed? Hmm. You know, it, you know what what are you scared of? And and a lot of the people, I think it's a money thing. You know, they they have a job, it pays them an income, and they have to jump off into not you know, not making income. And my 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 advice there is you got to save money. Hmm. You need to save up money in your savings account by keeping your operating expenses low, so that you can take years off without making a dime and not have your style and cost of living or whatever it is or your lifestyle go down. So that's step one. You have to save money. Um, step two is, you know, paint yourself the picture of what what is what's the dream, right? What do you want to do? So many people want to start their companies and I, I bet them money that, I, that they will succeed. It, it, it's not rocket science. It's hard work, yeah, but what isn't? You know, you're working hard at your regular job. You know, and so, but if you paint the picture of success, and then just kind of like lay out a pragmatic path of kind of how you validate and get there, it's going to seem a lot scarier. And so like just like how you clean up your room when you're a kid, you, know, you don't just try to clean the whole room. You just clean your bed off first, and then you go to the floor, and then you clean the dresser. And so by breaking things down, I think almost an, any huge business that you're building can be uh, broken down into steps. So anyways, those are my two t tips. Save money and uh, accomplish it one step at a time. Well, when asking, you know, uh, future entrepreneurs, you know, what they're scared of, what were you scared of, or were you scared, or were you so too young was, to be scared? <laughs> so, yeah. So when I turned down my full-time job offer with Microsoft, I mm -hmm. think, you know, there was a little bit of fear there. So it was actually a really simple decision, because I knew that the mobile gaming space that we were entering and the team right from college that I had was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I could work at, at Microsoft anytime I wanted. I mean. That's not probably true. Microsoft's probably thinking like, no, we wouldn't bring you back. But they just spent all this money like validating that they wanted to hire me, right? Why would they just all of a sudden turn me down a year from now? Right. It doesn't make sense. Microsoft's not going anywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's stock value might go up and down depending on what they do with Windows Mobile, but the um, <laughs> you know, the uh, overall the opportunity is not moving. So I think that's that's what made it a really brain dead decision is I would have been a moron to not continue to work with Purblue and make it my full time gig. And so I, I think that was caused me the most stress. I think the most, I think the scariest thing for me has always been the people who have been following me. I'm not worried about myself running off a cliff by myself. That's fine. <laughs> like that's my own decision. Right. I'm concerned about dragging people along with me, and I think that's always scared me, and it's kept me really um, nimble on the steering wheel, because I, I really want to serve them the best I can, the employees that we brought along, and now here are the players too. I don't want to let them down either. And so, you know, I'm trudging along for success, but I, I'm doing it so that these people can uh, continue to have fun doing uh, working at this awesome company called Purblue. So, well, give me an example of uh, let's just talk, say one of your users or one of your uh, users of your game, one of your players. Um, what has made you most proud? What's one of the proudest moments you've had with either interacting with one of them or an email you received or a call or? So we get a lot of feedback from our players, and sure. so, some of our players are crazy. I have to admit, <laughs> you know, they, they send us very, very long messages explaining all the different things. And sure. I think, um, <clears throat> so that, that, it makes me proud in the sense that they're so passionate about what, what we've provided them. Yeah. Um, that's cool. That's cool. Sometimes it's a little disturbing, but um, it's cool. <laughs> so I would say um, when you see the players uh, truly, uh, so in, in virtual worlds in general, like, we're all human, 
and the human nature never goes away, right? And right. when we see, I, what I think I get the most excited about is the trading that's happening inside our little internal economy. And when you have all these people who are analyzing the market and understanding if the price of gold is going to go down or up or what commodities they should be buying and trading. Now, I just like economics. But seeing that we've been able to create that for these other people to get a lot of a big kick out of trading um, commodity resources in, the, in a virtual world that don't exist, right? None of these things exist. They're right. all just bits in a database. Um, that's pretty cool. And so I, I nerd out with that, and I get pretty excited about those features. So what does the future look like for per blue and uh, parallel kingdom. So two questions, and if you could just address them both as separate questions, it'd be great. Yeah, so for per blue in particular, you know, we are, actually, no, for parallel kingdom in particular, you know, we have a great set of players already out there. We have a great game already out there. And so we're going to continue to make it more interesting, add a little, you know, add, continue to evolve the depth and try to make it a game that we can kind of continue to scale for the next, for the upcoming years. I mean, I, I think the lifetime of, of parallel kingdom as an entertaining product is far from over. So Peril Kingdom, but, but it's more of, a, of similar stuff. You know, it's a, a Kingdom mm -hmm. Conquest game. Um, so as far as so that's Peril Kingdom, for Per Blue, um, we have some exciting things in the pipeline. So with the success of Peril Kingdom that we've been able to experience, we've been able to move that the, the revenue from that and being able to invest in new projects. So we've got some new things coming out mm -hmm. in a very soon order here. Um, which should be exciting. And so that's that's abstract and not very helpful. But the the thing I will also say is that you know we love deep gameplay. We found uh, cr great value that we're creating by providing deep gameplay on the phone, which I don't think many people realize yet. So that's that's one of our focuses that we're hitting. And the second one is location-based gaming. We view is far from over. PK, you know, we've we've stretched some legs and we've done some really interesting things, but we have a lot more creative ideas on how to make location-based gaming really big. So, the future for Per Blue is really those two things: deep location-based games, and we'll see how that goes. Excellent. And what's on the horizon from an entrepreneurial standpoint? Yeah. So, um, with that focus thing I was saying earlier, you know, I'm I'm very focused on, on this this growth strategy. So, starting a company is one thing. But growing a company is a separate thing. And they're very two different things. And so I'm, I'm very excited about the growth. So that's my current challenge right now is how do we grow this? How do we scale up our teams? How do we scale the creative pipeline? How do we make sure our marketing is all working and things like that? So um, that's my current challenge now. Um, my goal is, and I continue to advise and mentor um, other entrepreneurs. Um, and then eventually I want to uh, kind of continue to do that. So I'm, I'm trying to... Um, create value by by sitting in on boards and um, and doing advising for other startup companies, cool. especially business direct B two C companies, and so that's been entertaining too. So and eventually, um, I hope to start more companies. So after Per Blue is done, you know, I will um, hopefully found a few more companies, and I kind of want to found about five companies before I die. Cool. We'll see how that goes, but <laughs> maybe less, maybe more. Yeah, well, you're off to a good start, obviously. So. Uh, let's try a little experiment. So I know with Skype, uh, we have a screen share option. Is there any way that you could take us uh, with your computer on a screen share and show us what Per Blue and uh, Parallel, well, what Parallel Kingdom looks like? Hmm. So let me. Uh, hmm. That is a good question. So I've seen it done. I've never done it, but I think there's a little screen share thing that. Yeah, I. You know what? I think I might have. To pass on this. Okay, um, no worries. Yep, I think for simplicity's sake, I'm going to have to pass. Okay, well then how, uh, how can fans and uh, future users connect with you and Per Blue? Yeah, so the first thing is if they have a smartphone, you can okay. download Parallel Kingdom and give it a whirl. Um, that's, you know, so just search Parallel or, or Kingdom, PK, Parallel Kingdom. And you can also visit the website, you know, and so I can, let me, you know, yeah, I now see the purpose of the screen share. The, uh, so, you know, Peril Kingdom, uh, you can download in the App Store, Android, iPhone. Um, you can also search it for it on Facebook, I think. So we have a fan group. Um, so I'm also available on Twitter. Um, you know, I Twitter at uh, Justin K. Beck. Um, so that's K as in cat. Uh, not, no, not K as in cat. And K as in, like, kitten. There we go. Got it. <laughs> and the, uh, the uh, so we, we Twitter a chunk. Um, Perbu also has a website which we have a blog. Um, you know I have a blog too. So I, I'm at justinkbeck.com. I mostly talk about entrepreneurial things, business advice, finance, hobbies, travel, things like that. Um, Perbu talks about games. Um, you know, locate deep location-based gaming in particular. Um, 
so those are the ways that we'd love for you to reach out, you know, so feel free to, um, you know, follow me on Twitter or something like that, or, you know, shoot me a message. Um, you know, I, I would love to reach out with people. And so. Yeah. Great. Well, and then obviously the a core focus and mission of Icos is to really bring about collaboration and connection amongst leaders. Are there any collaborative partners that you yourself uh, or your team are looking for, whether that be developers or other uh, gaming people or anything of the sort? Yeah, so as far as this, you know, we are, you know, kind of continually hiring both artists, engineers, marketing stat people. That's been, um, that's been very fun and, you know, anyone to join our team. You know, the other thing that's, that's true is, you know, we continue to partner with other companies on, on customer acquisition and partnerships. Um, you know, so that's, that's happening as well. And then if you're an entrepreneur and you're kind of working on your business, you know, I would love to, you know, chat with you and just become connected with you because that's just something I enjoy doing. And so, I, I continue to build out a, a good network and um, help advise and, and help companies and just have a conversation. You know, I, I enjoy that um, because I love business and I love nerding out about startups. So, Excellent. Well, Justin, thank you very much for your time. This has been a great session and we wish you all the best uh, with your um, team over at Per Blue and Parallel Kingdoms. Excellent. Thank you, Eli. All right. Thank, all thank you. you. Take Bye -bye. care. Thank mm -hmm. you.